Hello my friends, welcome back. It's market day. What would you like me to bring you back from the marketplace? Diamonds, rubies, pearls, or just a glimpse, just the chance of an encounter with the other world? My friends, the story I have for you today is called Finnist, the Bright Falcon. Now, this is something a bit different to the stories I've been telling you on this channel before. This is a Slavic folktale, uh, Eastern Slavic folktale, Russian, if you like. A lot of folklore from Western Europe, it's been sort of straightened out over the centuries. I think maybe the, the sort of Western, contemporary Western rationalistic mind has, you know, just sort of made the story a bit more logical over the years. That's not always the case with these Russian folk tales or Slavic folk tales. They're just, they're, they're, they're still one step closer to, to a kind of dream logic. They're very surreal, they're quite rambunctious, but they contain a lot, a lot of uh, juju, a lot of good magic, a lot of uh, nourishment, psychological and spiritual. So, uh, without further ado, my friends, I would like to tell you the story of Finnist, the Bright Falcon. And as always, my friends, if anything particularly resonates with you in this story, because remember, all aspects of this story, whether falcon or princess or witch, is an aspect of you, of your deep self. So if some particular image resonates in this story, just maybe sort of wonder and inquire why that is. Where are you in this story? If you want to, let me know in the comments section below. And as always, my friends, if you like this content on storytelling in the oral tradition and our mythic heritage, then do please give this video a like and a subscribe. That would help me out very much. Thank you. Long ago, Long, long ago, at the edge of a deep, tangled forest, there was a certain merchant. He wasn't particularly rich, he wasn't particularly poor, but he had three daughters, and one day his dear, dear wife passed away. Now, this uh, man, he decided he would get a housekeeper to do all the household chores. Now his wife had passed away, but his youngest daughter, who was an absolute sweetheart, let's call her Mariushka, she said, don't worry, father, I will do all the chores myself. And so she did. She would make the beds, she would sweep, she would collect the firewood, she would make the fire, she would do all the cooking. Her elder two sisters, mind you, they did nothing. They were lazy and they would taunt their younger sister. And all they were interested in was finery and pearls and lovely things. And they were very, very, very wicked to their little sister. So far, so Cinderella. Now, one day, market day was happening in town, and Dad goes to his three darling daughters and says the immortal words, what would you like me to bring you from the marketplace? Well, as you can probably guess, the older two girls said, oh, bring me dresses, bring me pearls, bring me shoes. And what would you like, little Mariushka? said Dad to his dear, darling, youngest daughter. And she said, oh, nothing, Daddy, or if anything at all, would you please bring me the feather of Finnist the Bright Falcon? Interesting request. Obviously, there was a, a lot going on in the internal landscape of this young child. <laughs> Obviously, the two older sisters mocked and taunted her request, but off Dad went into town. You know, that took him sort of a good half a day to reach along the craggy mountain pass. So, market day was in full flow, and he managed to find all sorts of um, bits of cloth and dresses and trinkets for his eldest two daughters, but nowhere could he find a feather of Finnist the Bright Falcon. So he returned with a heavy heart and his eldest two daughters were overjoyed. They had all these wonderful things and they put on their dresses and paraded around in front of their younger sister and said, look at us, aren't we pretty? And nothing for you! <laughs> Next day, market day rolls around. Dad asked the same question. What would you like me to bring you from the marketplace? Well, the eldest two sisters say, ooh, the latest iPhone. Oh, bring me a nice new hat. Bring me this, bring me that. 
but the youngest daughter, she just said, bring me a feather of Finnist the Bright Falcon. So off dad goes on his, one, on his walk into town. And he finds the latest iPhone, I don't know, what are we on, 15? He finds a nice new hat. He gets all the loveliest things, all the most wonderful, fashionable things for his eldest two daughters. But nowhere can he find a feather of Finnist the Bright Falcon. Except he's leaving. He's just on his way out of town. And he sees on that road, on that craggy mountain pass leading away out of town, there's an old bent man that he's never seen before. He has a long crooked nose, he has little beady eyes, he's bald on top with just a little wisp of grey hair, he's bent over like this, he has thin little legs and he's carrying a very precious looking ornate lacquered box with a big lock on it. And uh, you know the man, he's, he's curious, the merchant is curious and he asks this old traveller, <laughs> what's in the box? And the man says, ah, <laughs> I have in my box the feather from Finnist the Bright Falcon. And the merchant says, what? You have no idea. I've been searching for the feather of Finnist the Bright Falcon for my youngest daughter. She's been asking for it week in, week out. She won't shut up about it. Please, will you let me buy this feather from you? I will give you anything. Look, I've got gold, I've got silver. I'll give you anything. Well, says the old man. <laughs> you can have the feather for free because the price is not yours to be paid. The price will be paid by your daughter. Uh, sounds a bit ominous, <laughs> said the merchant, but he knew he would not hear the end of it if he would not get the feather of Finnis the Bright Falcon for his youngest daughter, Mariushka. So he said, all right, all right, just give me the feather. He was given the feather and he walked about on his way and then he just stopped and he turned around and the old man was gone vanished. The mountain path was empty. All he could see was hawks, birds of prey, circling above the valley outside of town. Ah, thought the merchant. But he didn't think much more of it. And he walked home and gave his eldest two daughters their iPhones and their hats and their shoes and their dresses and their diamonds and their pearls and all their lovely frippery and finery of this world. And then he presented little Mariushka with the feather of Phyllis the Bright Falcon. And she was overjoyed, her little heart burst. And she rushed upstairs to her room way up in the attic and closed the door. And oh, how her elder sisters did laugh. Now, day was turning into night and little Mariushka opened her window and just gazed at her feather and began to just wave it at the night sky. <laughs> Clearly there was something going on deep inside her. Something, some uh, deep education of the heart was taking place. Now, no sooner had she done this, opened the window, than a hawk, a falcon, suddenly flew out of the gloaming, out of the deep rich purple uh, blossoming of the night and flew in through her window and landed right there on her dresser. And then there it flickered for a while. It flickered halfway between man and falcon before turning into a very, very handsome young man with a very strong nose. <laughs> so <clears throat> the girl was overjoyed. It's as if uh, some piece of her soul that had always been missing had suddenly flown through the window and now was in deep conversation with her and they talked for hours all through the night all through the night they shared stories and just when dawn was breaking rosy fingered dawn was breaking over the horizon he declared his love to her they shared a kiss and then he said, I must depart because by day I must be a falcon soaring through the sky and by night I can turn into human form again and we can be together. And when we are married, the curse will be broken and we both can be humans together. Until that day, my love, a kiss. And he flew, turning into a falcon 
out on the wings of dawn and away, away, away into the shifting skies. So this went on <laughs> night after night after night. Mariushka would go and lock herself in her room after she had done all her chores and then finished the bright falcon would come and just maybe tap at her window with his beak and his multicoloured, multi-feathered, uh, radiant form would come in through the window and he would transform into her lover and they would talk through the night, they would share a kiss, maybe some other stuff, I don't know, and then um, he would fly away again. Now, some time later, the fair was coming to town. The fair was rolling into town and anyone who is anyone was going to be there. Now, Mariushka's elder two sisters, they put on quite a show. They put on all their dresses. They gossiped about all the fancy people that they were going to see. And of course, they taunted and mocked Mariushka. You see, since Finnis the Bright Falcon had come into Mariushka's life, she had had a certain inner confidence, a certain inner calm, and her elder two sisters hated that, and they would always try and puncture her bubble of strength and confidence that she carried inside her. You haven't got any dresses to go to the ball, to go to the fair. You're going to have to stay home. Well, if that's the way it's going to be, then... I suppose that's the way it's going to be, replied Mariushka. So off dad went with his two eldest sister and he sadly hugged his youngest daughter goodbye and said, uh, well, I'm sorry you're not coming with us, darling, but uh, you know, you always were one to keep to yourself, weren't you? So off they went to the ball. <laughs> dad and uh, the two elder sisters and Mariushka waved her little feather at the window and finished the bright falcon, flew in through there and Mariushka said, can't we go to the ball? And he said, sure, we can go to the ball. And just like that, think, 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 think. He plucked feathers from his wings and they turned into dresses, into a crystal carriage, into horses. Again, so far, so Cinderella. And they get into the carriage and ride away and they go to the ball. They go to the fair and no one recognises her. They think some princess from a far distant land has come. They are the talk of the town. They're gossip, 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 gossip. And Mariushka, before the end of the evening, makes a quick getaway with her handsome prince and the carriage rolls back along the mountain pass back to her home. And she takes off all her clothes and puts her normal, uh, you know, old dusty old smocks back on. Finished flies away, but foolishly, she had forgotten to take out a single diamond pin from her hair. Later that evening, a little bit tipsy, Dad and the two elder sisters get back and they'll say, you'll never believe you missed out on such a great thing, little sis. A princess came and you'll never believe how beautiful she was. So much more beautiful than you. Oh, you can barely even imagine it. And Mariushka says, well, to be honest, it feels like I was there anyway. Your description has just been so um, accurate. <clears throat> but then one of the uh, elder sisters noticed something glinting in little Mariushka's hair. It was a diamond pin and they tried to seize it. But before they could, Mariushka ran upstairs and locked the door. You've stolen it, they said. And they went and told dad and said that Mariushka had stolen a diamond pin from some fair lady. And dad said, hush, 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 hush. But the girls were suspicious now. And that night they crept up. And what did they hear from behind Mariushka's door? A man's voice and they were conversing. And again, they went and told father. But father said, don't be jealous of your little sister. You just mind your own business. Well, they see that that. So they crept into the garden the next night. And what did they see that evening? But a falcon fly through Mariushka's attic window and turn into a handsome prince. And they would converse together. How dare she have that? Oh, how they hated that envy burned inside them. But they knew dad would do nothing. So the older sisters, they had to take matters into their own hands. You know what they did? They got bits of glass and knives and needles and barbed wire and all sorts of sharp, jagged, unpleasant things. And they arranged them all sticking out outside Mariushka's attic window. So then the next evening, when Mariushka <clears throat> lay sleeping on her bed, Finnis the bright falcon came to tap at her window, but he was 
torn, his wings were stabbed by all these sharp implements again and again and again and again. It, with the hopeless desperation of the young lover, he tried to get in through her window, but his wings were being torn to shreds like a, like a moth against a flame. He batted against that window again and again and again until her window pane was smeared with blood. In the end, he gave up and he cried out. He cried out in the secret language of his own heart. He cried, Mariushka, 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 you clearly don't love me anymore. So I'm gone and you will never find me again. And if, if by some tiny stretch of fate you wish to find me, you must seek me out. You must seek me out at the very edge of the world that is so far away, you must walk and you must wear through three pairs of iron shoes, wear through three iron staves, and gnaw through three iron loaves of bread. Pretty cosmic state of time there. And with that, Fenist flew away, away, away into the night. And Mariushka, she, she slept on but had troubled dreams. And she felt that she could hear, she could hear, she could hear Finnist's words in her dreams. And the next day she woke up and she was distraught. She saw, she saw, she knew, she understood what her sisters had done. And without a word, she did not say goodbye to her father, to her sisters. She went straight to the blacksmith and had three pairs of iron shoes made, three iron staffs and three iron loaves of bread. See what I'm talking about, that strange, surreal imagery in these stories. And she set off walking, just like that. She just walked through the tangles of forest, through the ragged mountain passes, through desolate marshes. The crows and the deer and the wolves and the bears were her friends as she walked alone. She walked for time upon time upon time upon time. For eons she walked. <laughs> this is where this story gets, gets very, very deep. Until eventually she had worn through the first pair of shoes and worn through the first iron staff and gnawed all the way through that first iron loaf of bread and she came to in the deep dark fringes at the very depth of the tangled labyrinth of the forest a little hut a little hut and inside that little hut there was a light there was a fire burning in the grate. Mariushka approached this hut but as she got close as she was just about to knock the hut shot up in the air. It turned out the hut was on chicken's legs and the hut walked a little further into the forest and then nestled back down again. Mariushka approached again and the hut boom, sprang up on legs, walked a little further into the wood and then nestled back down again. On the third approach Mariushka decided that she would call out this time. She said, hello whoever's inside I'm looking for food and shelter and warmth and maybe a little bit of advice. I need help. I need help. I've worn through these iron shoes. I'm looking for Finnist, the bright falcon who dwells at the edge of the world. Can you help me? <laughs> the door opened. Mariushka entered and inside was a little fire and a little rocking chair and there was a little old lady sat, you know, stroking a cat. <laughs> and some people call her Baba Yaga. <laughs> And she had warts all over her face and her teeth were yellow and her eyes were like little black gimlets and she said, Hello, my dear. You are looking for Finnist the Bright Falcon. I can tell you the way, but first you need to visit my sister here who is even older and wartier than I am. Here, take this gift. It was a ball of twine. It will show you the way. You just roll it out in front of you and that ball, but don't leads the way through the tangled thatch of forest. <laughs> this is a very, very old mythic motif. I'm sure you've seen it many times before. So off Mariushka went and she wore through another pair of iron shoes, wore down another iron staff and gnawed the way through another iron loaf of bread until she came to another hut deep in a desolate marsh with will-o'-the-wisps glowing round it and the stink emanating from the bogs. And she said, hello, I've come. I'm looking for Phyllis the Bright Falcon. Your sister has sent me. 
and Mariushka walked into the second witch's hut. And if the first Baba Yaga, Yaga was ugly and warty, this one was even uglier and wartier. And the warts had warts growing on the warts, and she had tusks growing out of her face, and her breasts were so long and saggy, they stuck out the bottom of her skirt. <laughs> Well, she gave her another gift. This time it was hmm, a silver bowl and a golden apple, which would just roll around on that silver dish. What does that mean? I don't know. Maybe you know. Let me know in the comments. So, <laughs> Mariushka journeyed on, journeyed on through the marshes, through desolate mountain passes, through blizzards, through cold, harsh winters, through hot summers, through the forests again, until through eons and eons and eons she had worn through another pair of iron shoes and another iron staff and another iron loaf of bread until she came to the third and final sister, the third Baba Yaga. And oh, if the first two sisters were ugly and hideous and old, here was the crone herself. And you could not even see her eyes, what with warts and wrinkles. And she had a beard and the pubes growing down onto the earth and her tits lactated deadly nightshade and her breath killed sparrows. <laughs> you have come at last. You are almost at the palace of Finnist the Bright Falcon. Here, take this. And it was a golden spinning wheel that span by itself. No effort was required. And she said, you now have three gifts. You must go to the edge of the world and there will be a floating palace, a floating city. You must hurry because your beloved Finnis the Bright Falcon is engaged to be wed to the queen at the edge of the world. But all is not lost. You must go and you must make yourself a servant in the queen's palace and she will ask to buy these objects that I and my sisters have given you. Do not sell them. Barter them. They are your inheritance. Trade them for a night with Finnis the Bright Falcon. After that, you will know what to do. So, Mariushka set off through the tangled web, through the labyrinths of time and memory and human culture and through the wild, until eventually she reached the edge where the land stopped, the edge of things, where everything sings at the edge of the world. And there she sat down upon a cliff face and hovering over the deep, dark waters at the edge of the world was a great citadel, a city floating in the sky. And it was like nothing you'd ever seen. It had towers of glass and shimmering marble. It was, it was, it was incredible. You know, have you ever seen those old sort of Eastern Orthodox churches, you know, like in the center of Moscow? It's like that, but times a thousand percent. It was dripping with hallucinogenic beauty. This, this spinning city the edge of the world. And she sat for a long time and eventually a boat docked itself, undocked itself from that city and came floating through the air and just moored at the, at the cliff edge. It was a flying galleon and all sorts of men in fantastic golden livery got out of that ship and asked Mariushka, what are you doing here? You know, you've come to the edge of the world. And she said again and again and again, I've come to be a servant in the Queen's palace. Ah, excellent timing, said the uh, chief footman. She is looking for a new servant and you seem to uh, fit the bill, yes? Hmm. <laughs> so Mariushka got into the boat and it sailed up to the city at the edge of the world, spinning in sky above the deep, 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 dark waters that dwell inside all of us. And she became a servant inside the Queen's palace. She started in the kitchens, sweating over the fire, scrubbing the floors, and she worked her way up until gradually she was allowed to serve the wine or the vodka or the borscht or whatever it is at the Queen's own table. And sat there was her love, Finnist, the bright falcon, in human form, all dressed up to the nines and all his kind of lovely silken shirts. But dressed as she was as a servant, he did not recognise her. Even if he had looked up, he wouldn't have recognised her. It seemed as if he was deep in a kind of waking dream, in a kind of trance. His eyes were 
glazed over. This is the look of people that maybe aren't following their true calling in life, I feel. And Finnist was engaged to be wed to a woman that he did not love. He was a trophy fiancé. Now, one evening, Mariushka, she just um, gets out her magic spinning wheel that spins without any effort. And the queen takes notice of it and she says, oh, it's a nice trinket. How much, servant girl? I want it. I want it. How much? She had a little bit of the older sister in her, this queen. How much? Give it me. Give it me. And she said, ah, 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 it's not for sale, but I will trade it for one night with your fiancé, Finnist the Bright Falcon. Hmm, the queen mulled over the uh, suggestion in her head. Well, yes, why not? But she had a trick up her sleeve. She gave Finnist a sleeping potion so that he slept all through the night. And when Mariushka had given away her spinning wheel, she went up and uh, could not wake Finnist. And she shook him violently. She wept, she cried, she sang to him. She spoke of all the things. She said, I've come, I've worn through three pairs of iron shoes, worn through three iron staffs. I've gnawed through three loaves of bread. Finnist, my beloved, it's me, I've come. Nothing, nothing. Well, I trust you had a good evening, said the queen the next day. <laughs> the next evening, Mariushka was there with her silver plate and her golden apple, just rolling it around the, uh, rolling it around the bowl. And Queenie comes up and goes, hmm, that looks nice. Sell it to me, darling. Sell it to me. How much do you want? Money? Diamonds? Pearls? And she says, I will trade it for one night with Finnist, the bright falcon. Well, what's that to me? You're welcome to waft the flies from his face as he sleeps. <laughs> Macabre image. So, same thing happens again, I'm sorry to report. Finnist had been given the sleeping draught and he would not wake no matter how much Mariushka shook him. Next night, all she had left was the ball of twine, the ball of twine that leads the way. It was her most precious possession, but she traded it for one night with Finnist, the bright falcon. And no matter how much she cried and cried and cried, nothing would wake him until one drop, one tear fell and landed on his arm. <laughs> Eros, Cupid, Taliesin, Finn McCool, all of these heroes of myth all stood behind Finnist, the bright falcon, right now as he <laughs> woke up as if he had been dreaming his whole life. And he looked into his beloved's eyes, they gazed into each other's eyes, and suddenly, they understood. The whole world dropped away. They embraced one another and there, then, they made their escape. They ran through the palace streets. But dawn was breaking now. Dawn was breaking and the queen noticed that her lover's bed was empty and she called all the guards, the Cossacks, hey, 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 were running through the streets. The, the winged sentinels that guard the palaces were flying down all around them. Strange, mechanised foot soldiers and golems were coming through this city at the edge of the world, they were surrounded in the great courtyard at the centre of the royal palace and the queen said, get them! And Finnis said, wait, wait! And he was talking to all the windows of the assorted nobles and commoners and soldiers and everyone in this bright city at the edge of the world and he said, which wife deserves me? The one that sold me? or the one that bought me again. And in a chorus of voices all in one, everyone said, the one that bought you again. This didn't please the queen and she said, seize them. But in that moment, dawn had broken and Finnist and Mariushka turned into falcons and flew into the sky and were never seen in that part of the world again. They landed back at her father's door <laughs> and he was overjoyed to see them both and of course my friends there was a wedding a wedding for the girl that had been to the very edge of the world and returned a girl with a spirit of 
a falcon <laughs> and my friends that wedding lasted seven long days and i'm told i'm told <laughs> it took seven men seven days just to stir the mustard and my friends if you put your ear to the ground you can still hear them feasting and that when that wedding day was done finished and mariushka flew off into the sky into the soul of the world and into another story so my friends if you've been following this channel for a while uh, you will know that I have a certain theory uh, and I'm not alone in this about our folklore about our oral tradition that these aren't stories to entertain simple-minded peasant folk or moralized children contained in these stories is is uh, medicine and there are certain uh, psychological or psychic kind of pressure points buried within these stories in a kind of dream language or symbolic metaphorical language of the deep mind that speaks to us on a deeper level and helps us navigate this ship in the night that we call life. So just a few things about this story. You will have noticed a few sort of mythic resonances in this story. Um, the ball of twine, Theseus and the labyrinth, uh, navigating the underworld, uh, Coneda and the golden apples. There's also that, that Celtic story I've told on this channel before. There's a ball of twine in there. Quite a common image. We've all got one of these balls of twine. We just don't always follow it. Also, um, there's a bit of Eros and Psyche, as I've already mentioned in this story, uh, or Cupid and Psyche. This is an ancient Greek myth. Um, Cupid is the god of desire, of, of, of um, sort of erotic love, Eros. Psyche uh, is the Greek word for soul. So in this story as well, uh, I think we have resonances of this. It's about, the, it's about our journey to connect with the higher self or the soul, uh, I think, in essence. That's what, the, that's what the falcon represents. So you think of, say, um, maybe falcon imagery in ancient Egyptian art. You know, the, uh, I think it's called the ka, uh, the, the aspect of the soul that transmigrates from body to body to body. Uh, this, is the, this is the bartering that we're doing, I think, in myth-telling and also in our lives to try and contact something deeper, the spiritual dimension of life. So that's what Mariushka is doing in this story and that's what we're all doing. So, my friend, what gift <laughs> can we bring back from the edge of the world? Um, Thank you very much for listening, my friends. Uh, as I said earlier in this video, do please feel free to like and subscribe if you like this sort of content. I've also got a Patreon um, page if you want to give me some um, financial support in doing this. Uh, no pressure, but if you are able to do so, I will put a link at, uh, in the comments below uh, so you can do that. Um, or I will play another story now. Thank you very much, my friends. and. Do feel free to let me know um, where you are in this story and what other story you might like me to tell you. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.